symposium 11 uh, on a sunny Sunday morning in Karachi. My name is Dr. Atif Majid. I am an assistant professor at the National Institute of Liver and GI Diseases, Dow University Hospital, Karachi. Um, we've started our liver transplant program recently and we're in, uh, in the position to, you know, propagate it more so much so that it becomes a very flourished transplant center. Uh, it's, I've been given a difficult task, I feel, because uh, liver transplantation itself is a fellowship in its own. Uh, the subject has whole libraries on it, and covering it in two hours would uh, actually be in doing injustice to the subject. But on the other hand, I'm fortunate to have speakers who are internationally well-renowned and uh, esteemed. So without any further delay, I would like to start off with our presentation. I would like to introduce our chairs first for this session. Uh, firstly, we've got uh, Dr. Faisal Saudar, uh, who needs no introduction. He's the pioneer of liver transplantation in Pakistan. He's had more than 1,000 living donor living transplants done in Pakistan. He's established a number of centers and he's already mentored a number of people who are doing independent liver transplantations. Subsequently, we've got Dr. Abdul Wahab Dogar. He's been his, uh, under the mentorship of Dr. Faisal Saudar as well, and he's also a well-renowned hepatobiliary transplant surgeon who's uh, doing independent liver transplants at the Gumbert Institute of Medical Sciences, which is also a very well-renowned um, liver transplant center and it has performed the maximum number of liver transplantations in Sindh. Then we've got uh, Dr. Asif Beg in our panel. Dr. Asif Beg is also a well-renowned uh, transplant hepatologist who accompanies Dr. Abdul Wahab Dogar at Gumbert Institute of Medical Sciences, and uh, he is uh, the leading hepatobiliary transplant hepatologist, uh, the, the hepat uh, transplant hepatologist there. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Shahid Kareem as well, and Dr. Shahid Kareem is an associate professor of gastroenterology hepatology at Liaquat National uh, Hospital, which is also a very well-renowned and um, uh, active uh, center in Karachi, with uh, a lot of patients uh, being managed there. And uh, lastly, for our chairs, we've got Dr. Abu Bakr Hafiz, who's from Islamabad, Shifa International. He's uh, a liver transplant surgeon over there as well. So I welcome all the chairs and I thank them for sparing uh, the Sunday morning, which usually is dedicated to rest, but they've uh, committed this to academics. And I welcome them all to our uh, Symposium 11 of the PSSLD. Uh, we've got uh, renowned speakers and uh, they've got a long introduction. The first presentation is uh, with Dr. Bilal Hamid. Dr. Bilal Hamid is uh, a very well around hepatologist. He's uh, been very kind to us that he's always supported us at uh, the PSSLD and mostly at the Pakistani um, uh, international conferences and national conferences that are there. Dr. Bilal, he's uh, a head of uh, transplant hepatology at, and chief uh, at the University of uh, California, San Francisco, USA and uh, he's had a number of publications and he's got a number of uh, mentors and he's got a very keen interest towards teaching as well. So without any further delay, I would like to hand over the, 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 uh, the podium to Dr. Bilal. Just uh, a small comment, uh, if, if there are any questions, it is requested to please pose them on the chat box and kindly also uh, right to whom they are addressed to and all the question and answer sessions will be taken in the end so thank you very much and over to dr bilal hamid assalamu alaikum everyone first of all i would like to thank the organizing committee for the kind invitation unfortunately because of the pandemic you're not able to see each other in person, but hopefully next year, I'll put my talk today is liver transplant or personalized immunosuppression. Below are my disclosures, but none of them are relevant for today's talk. Outline of my talk today is to discuss what are the current immunosuppression and the patterns we are seeing. How do we monitor 
and also understand long-term side effects of immunosuppression? What is tolerance? And how do we aim towards more personalized immunosuppression in liver transplant candidates? Immunosuppression is a non-specific inhibition of immune responses against transplanted organ, pathogens, or cancer. The goal is to find the right balance. It is always a balancing act. It is a double-edged sword, as our main goal is always to prevent graft, graft dysfunction and rejection. Early on, we were using much higher doses of immunosuppression because we were scared of rejection and graft dysfunction. However, in the past decade, we are understanding that our patients are living much longer, and we started seeing the long-term side effects of these medications, including risk of malignancies, renal failure, metabolic complications, infections, and cardiovascular disease. At this time, we don't have any clinically useful tools that are available to correctly manage immunosuppression or tells us which patients are managed indifferently except for following their trough drug levels. When we talk about the overall consideration for immunosuppressive regimen, we know that the risk of rejection is highest in the first month. 75% of all rejections happen during this time. After one year, the risk of re rejection is much lower and we initially give higher doses early on and as time goes on, we taper the immunosuppression. Rejection rates also vary which organ we are transplanting with highest for pancreas, then kidney, and the liver. Liver is also a tolerogenic organ, and we rarely see grafts being lost due to rejection. So based on these principles, a lot of immunosuppressive regimen and protocols have been devised by individual centers. There are two phases of immunosuppression. The first is induction, and most common induction regimen we are using in the United States is high-dose steroids. The use of antibody reduction, uh, induction is less common, up to 25%. And then after 30 days, there are patients need to be on long-term maintenance. Again, in this, it is also shown here that the incidence of acute rejection is highest in the first year of transplant and overall become less common after that period of time. This is a, a study uh, which was uh, data from our uh, US SRTR which shows that overall trends in the United States from 2004 to 2016. As I mentioned earlier, majority of patients do not require antibody reduction, about 20 to 25% mostly with IL-2 agents. And these are the patients who are, have more risk of renal dysfunction that these patients are getting. We have used has seen increased use of mycophenolate in more than 80% of patients post-liver transplant. Prograft is the most common immunosuppression. When we talk about the calcium inhibitor, these are the backbones of our immunosuppressive regimen. Over a period of time, there are few patients who are on cyclosporin. At the same time, the mTOR inhibitor use is about 10% after one year. And this has been increased early on because of renal protective effect, but then the black box warning of serolimus came on for hepatic artery thrombosis. So the first 30 days, there are a few centers who are using it. And then for mainly renal protection or some patients with hepatocellular cancer or other cancers that the use of mTOR inhibitor is slowly getting more popularity. Now, this is just uh, a simple diagram showing different regimen for immunosuppression. Again, the point is that different transplant centers based on their own expertise and experience using this regimen, most of the patients early on are on three drug regimen at the time of transplant and over a period of time, they're either one or two regimen, but that is where the personalized medicine 
help, especially personalized immunosuppression and liver transplant will be very important. Uh, in our center, our patients at the time when we discharge them are on Prograf, Celsep, and prednisolone. Now, it is also important to understand that when you have these patients, how would you monitor these patients after transplant? So prednisone is a daily medication, and, but the, it is important to monitor these patients for their blood pressure, glucose, and lipids. Mycophenolate is a twice a day medication, and the most common is the GI side effects. And it is important to talk to the patient because if they're not able to tolerate this medication, we need to uh, either change the dosages of these medicate of mycophenolate or change it to a different regimen. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus are again twice daily medication. It's very important to check their trough levels, uh, kidney function, potassium, magnesium, and these patients can be at risk of CNS toxicity. The mTOR inhibitor, which is serolimus and erolimus, are either daily or twice daily. Everlimus is a twice daily medication. We also monitor their drug levels very closely. CDCs, lipid. These medications, when we talk about the side effects, can also impair wound healing. And therefore, if patients are needing any surgeries, it's not, uh, we need to hold this medication or stop it uh, before any major surgeries. It is important to understand that why our patients post-transplant dies. The most common, this is a study in 2015, which shows that patients after a year of transplant long-term malignancies is one of the highest risk, followed by cardiovascular disease and infections, then renal failure. So most of our planning on uh, post-transplant long-term immunosuppression will take into consideration these risk factors. And there are individual patients may have different risk factors, which we will discuss when we talk about the personalized art of immunosuppression. Now, the incidence of acute rejection varies by age. This is the data from SRTR in 2016, which shows that young patients who are 18 to 34 have a much higher rate of rejection as compared to folks who are older than 65. Overall, based on this data, we have seen that the, over, uh, the rate of rejections are stable and the incidence of acute rejection is about 10 to 13% by one year. Now, whenever you start a patient on medications, uh, immunosuppressive, you need to know exactly what are the side effects you would be seeing. You're all aware about the corticosteroid with bone disease, uh, patients will have hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and hypertension. The calcium inhibitors have been mostly, we worry about long-term kidney injury. Uh, the diabetes rate is much higher with, uh, with Prograf than cyclosporin, but hypertension and hyperlipidemia is present. Uh, mTOR inhibitors can cause proteinuria, so when you start the medication, we need to check their protein creatinine ratio then hyperlipidemia is also been associated. The mycophenolate mostly is GI uh, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Sometimes we see colitis and bone marrow suppression. It is also important for you to understand the drug medications that can cause interaction with immunosuppressive. This is just the list of antimicrobial. It is uh, in Pakistan, I have seen many patients who are anti-TB medication. So you need to understand which medication can increase the levels or uh, medications that can decrease the level. So you need to have a good understanding of these uh, medication. Again, when we talk specifically about calcium inhibitors, again, this is a list of medications that can cause uh, inhibit the metabolism and increase their drug level. And there are inducers of metabolism, which can decrease the drug level. And mostly uh, in for Pakistan is anti-TB medication like INH and rifampin. So if you're starting any of the, your patient on this regimen, you need to make sure that you plan to adjust <clears throat> the medication uh, while they are on these medications. Now, which one is more important? Whether it's tacrolimus versus cyclosporin, there is a lot of data out there. 
But as I mentioned early on, the ticrolimus or prograf is the most common immunosuppressive regimen that we use. It has, as compared to cyclosporin, it, patients have what better one-year mortality, one-year graft loss, decreased rate of acute rejection, decreased rate of steroid-resistant rejection, but it does increase the risk of diabetes. Renal dysfunction and need for antihypertensive are equal in both groups. In the US, the only group of patients that we have used cyclosporin if they have bad or worsening diabetes are some of those patients who have neurotoxicity early on with prograf or tacrolimus, we may consider cyclosporin in that scenario. One of the most common complications long-term that we see in patients with post uh, liver transplant is the incidence of renal failure. This is a study now published in 2003, which has shown that after intestinal transplant, liver patients have the highest rate of chronic renal failure. Incidence in liver transplant at five years was up to 18%. Now, chronic renal dysfunction or end-stage renal disease can happen up to 18% of patients within five years of liver transplant. And the use of calcineurin inhibitor is the most important risk factors. Uh, they can happen in multiple different reasons, but a lot of other cofactors can contribute, especially the pre uh, uh, transplant renal function is an important determinant how patients' renal function will do long term. So there are different strategies that transplant scientists have used, uh, and there are studies out there about the renal sparing studies for calcium inhibitor. One option is to delay and reduce CNI exposure, which minimize acute kidney injury, but these patients do require antibody induction. Uh, early in the first six, uh, one to six months for transplant, you do a reduction, typically in combination with non-nephrotoxic agent that can help improve and stabilize renal function. There is evidence that uh, mycophenolate and concurrent reduction and CNI therapy result in improvement in renal function even when performed greater than one year post liver transplant. And this is the strategy in our transplant site to be used that we reduce the CNI therapy and use MMF as an agent to make sure that we protect their renal function. Now, summary of the immunosuppression that we talked about is that we, at our, especially in our transplant center and most of the center, that we typical early regimen include Prograf, Celsep, and Prednisone. We try to wean off the steroids after six to 12 months. Single therapy after a few years. Exception is patient with autoimmune hepatitis or PSC or some young patients or someone with a prior history of rejection. Most of the centers start tacrolimus uh, as the more important calcium inhibitors. Only 25% centers in the U.S. using induction, mainly for renal sparing. This is expensive. mTOR inhibitors uh, increase utilization after one to three years for renal sparing and patients who had history of cancers. Now, the tolerance is a concept that is what we try to, it's a holy grail. It is the retraining the immuno, uh, immune system to regard the transplant organ as self while leaving the remainder of the immune system intact. Uh, the operational tolerance is the clinical circumstance where graft is stable without rejection in the absence of immunosuppression. So whether we can take our patients off immunosuppression completely and they can be uh, fine without rejection and that's what we try to achieve. There are some immunosuppression withdrawal studies that are available. But bottom line in these studies are, it can be possible in selected patient, and it's up to about 30 to 50% based on which study you st uh, look. But the late withdrawal in older patients are much successful about five years after transplant. But the important thing, if we are considering these patients, we do need a biopsy pre and post weaning at this time. But this is more and more studies are coming out. There was a recent paper from Dr. Feng in, in, uh, in children uh, was published in hepatology a few months back. In those patients, 37.5% patients were determined to be tolerant and they, can, they were weaned off of all the medications. 
So this is the future of immunosuppression, but we do need more personalized medicine for that reason. Now, lastly, when we talk about personalized medicine, it's a type of medical care in which treatment is customized for an individual patient. So right now, without personalized medicine, if you get it, that some patient will get a benefit, some do not. So we treat all the patients more or less the same. With personalized medic medicine, each patient receives the right medicine for them. A lot of biomarker diagnostic is needed, and then we can individualize. And that's what we are aiming in liver transplantation immunosuppression. So are we there yet? We are going towards it, but we're still not there. However, these are the some factors that I would consider um, that needed important to personalize. What is the etiology and what are the risk of recurrence in the patients who are getting transplant, whether they have hepatocellular cancer or other cancer? What are the risk of rejection and infection in that patient, or if they already had rejection before a patient had his a risk of higher infection? What is the renal function and metabolic syndrome, whether it's age, sex, and ethnicity, pregnancy uh, likelihood, because if someone wants to become pregnant, uh, we cannot use MMF, whether they are getting disease donor or living donor transplant, and what are the other donor factors? So we are now going towards personalized medication, um, personalized medicine and trying to adjust the immunosuppression based on these factors. But we do need more data. There is a lot of pharmacogenetic and omics data is coming on. We are seeing some variants in the uh, genes that can predict uh, uh, calcium inhibitors and even MMF. So we may be using more in the future. We are developing prediction and artificial intelligence model, more biomarkers and better drug assays and genetics will be available in the future that will make us more possible to, uh, to proceed towards personalized immunosuppression in our liver transplant patient. So lastly, immunosuppression again is a balancing act. Early on, our focus was to prevent rejection, but as I shown the data, the risk of rejection is lower. Uh, and now our focus is to manage the immunosuppression in a more personalized manner, prevent these long-term complication of immunosuppression. Thank you. And I would like to uh, end with a quote that I love is that superior doctors prevent the disease, mediocre doctors treat the disease before everything, and inferior doctors treat the full-blown uh, full disease. And my hope is that all of us in our liver transplant patients with immunosuppression can become superior doctors and prevent the long-term complication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bilal. Indeed, it was a very um, impo important issue that needed discussion. Immunosuppression is uh, a very important thing. It's the art of medicine post-liver transplant. Okay, uh, we'll take the questions in the end. Again, I uh, request that all the questions be posted in the chat, chat box and addressed to the speaker. Uh, next, we are fortunate to have Dr. Arsalan over here, who is uh, Associate Professor of Gastroenterology Hepatology at the SIN Institute of Urology and Transplantation. And uh, Dr. Arsalan will be talking about post-transplant challenges and their, how to deal with them. So, over to Dr. Arsalan. <laughs> Assalamualaikum and good morning. It is an honor to share this forum with national and international luminaries. Thank you, everyone, and especially Dr. Zagam Abbas for the privilege. I'll be talking about complications after liver transplant today, and I've taken the privilege or liberty of restricting myself during the next 15 minutes to analyzing how we are doing, or are we doing a good job as a liver transplant community. I have no disclosures. Uh, this is the scheme of ideas to follow. So transplant is a complex enterprise whereby we attempt to sustain an organ from one person to another while controlling the recipient's immune response and trying to prevent recurrence of the rare disease that caused the loss of the organ in the first place. Liver transplant places a premium on the whole process with even, derang with even more deranged physiology and difficult surgery to contend with. So how are we doing? Well, Pretty good. Based on this 18-year-old data from UNOS, uh, 18 years of data, sorry, from UNOS, it is indeed remarkable that the one-year survival after getting a liver transplant has improved 
from just 66% in 1987 to 92% by 2015. This busy graph represents data from European liver transplant registry in five-year segments over a span of 50 years. What is the story? Starting from the time of the first successful liver transplant in 1967, by 1980, one-year survival achieved was only 30%, but it doubled in the next five years to 60% by 1985 and kept on improving dramatically over the next 15 years to reach 81%. But the, but the that only changed incrementally since. So we have a stalled progress over the last 20 years. There is an alternative look at the similar data based on um, the analysis cohort of more than 2,000 patients from 1985 to 2003. The lowest survival curve in the graph on your left is from a period between 1985 to 1989 and shows a remarkable and shows a markedly lower survival. This difference though goes away in the next graph on your right when we eliminate the survival data from the first six months. What does that imply? We have only achieved improvement in survival during the first six months after the transplant. Indeed, if you look keenly, we find that difference in the outcome is just in the first 90 days, or specifically the perioperative phase. So the apparent improvement in long-term outcomes is actually the result of just a very short segment or very short-term outcome after the transplant. All the great strides we have made is essentially about perioperative mortality. So why is that? Looking at this colorful representation, which de depicts a very ominous data about causes of mortality in relation to duration of the, uh, after the liver transplant, it is obvious we may easily bisect this in two halves at the six month mark here. And um, the causes are related to graph where the initial period or the period before these six months, the causes of mortality are related to graph selection the technical problems during surgery, infections, and patient comorbidities. While in the latter part, it relates to the recurrence of the primary disease, de novo tumors, metabolic, and systemic diseases. So what led to the dramatic first jump in doubling survival? It was just one drug, cyclosporin, that improved immunosuppression so much that it changed liver transplant from an ex experimental procedure to a life-saving one, according to Stossel. You can see in this graph lower down here how the numbers increased every year after this. The gains during the next 15 years were pronounced, but these were the results of multiple factors adding incrementally rather than one big one that would change things dramatically. These are some of the examples, like you know, venous bypass pump at one point in time, like um, improving implantation times or reducing implantation times like uh, using different kind of preservation solutions with some showing better survival than the others. As a surgeon, I would like to look at some of the factors related to the transplant operation that affect the outcome, especially since it relates to the very early period of the transplant where we have made headway. So very briefly, we're doing the liver transplant surgery is challenging because we are performing this procedure in uh, this very major procedure in, the, in a very ill cirrhotic patients. Removing a very stiff liver from around the vena cava, operating through all the surrounding varices and collaterals, while the patient has very limited coagulation, and then trying to limit the blood loss is difficult by any standard. Followed this by replacing the allograft and sewing into the cava, portal vein requires skills. And this is tested even more when we, we are doing even a smaller graft in living donors especially the arteries and the bile ducts. Sorry for that. So a technically successful living donor transplant is a result of adequate graft size to prevent small for size, has good vascular inflow to ensure graft viability and prevent bleeding complication, has a good bile duct anastomosis, free of leaks and strictures, and a good outflow to prevent butt carry like syndrome. What does this translate to? So best is to compare between the deceased donor and the living donors. What we see in living donors, there is a higher propensity Thank for you. bile leaks or bile leak complications in general, the hepatic artery thrombosis and related blood infections because we are dealing with finite anastomosis, which limitation in the technical capabilities as well as the uh, technology available. Whereas in disease norm, we are transplanting a sicker patient. So we see more generalized systemic complications like pulmonary edema, ascites, cardiac complications. There's a huge set of other complications which are similar in distribution among the two types of transplants. 
this is again a graphical representation of uh, the similar um, of what we have already talked about. But more importantly, these differences persist even after 10 years post transplant. Interestingly, these differences between the two techniques, the living donor and deceased donor, do not translate into significant difference in graft and patient survival, as is evident from the curve in the middle. This is explainable because living donor transplants have a higher frequency of a relatively lower grade complications, that is grade three complications, whereas deceased donors have lower frequency but has a higher grade of complications, grade four complications, kind of canceling out the severity with the frequency. But these problems like BDBRDX have consequences and they lead to a lesser, lower survival at one, three, and five years. Similarly, hepatic artery thrombosis, a bane of living donor transplant, especially in children, uh, causes um, uh, significant graft dysfunction and uh, even survival loss over years. Evident once, once again in this graph is how significantly transplants in general reduces mortality for patients with end-stage liver disease. Additional information here is how transplant center experience with LDLT improves survival for the patient. So survival is less for the first 20 patients, but improves significantly after that, even get, getting even better than the deceased donor transplants. So despite a not notable incidence of early complication, our management of transplant patients appear to be working quite well. Any further improvement is likely to come incrementally. No major changes are warranted. The adage goes, let's not fix what's not broken. So dealing with complications, protocols are likely to yield consistency and better outcomes. Most patients with allograft complication present with deranged LFTs, for example. The steps to follow depend in large measure on the duration from the transplant. So the presentation is within two weeks of transplant. The focus is on surgical complications and primary reliance is on, is on imaging for the diagnosis, followed by biopsy if no pathology is evident. Even if that does not yield the result, then a wider differential needs to be addressed, which will need more investigation. For later presentation, like between two and six weeks, the reliance again is more on imaging, uh, followed by biopsy, but here rejection will be more likely and the propensity to widen differential will be even for more. After six months, the primary investigation in most instances, instances would be a biopsy. Late complications are where we have not made much headway. Let's explore this, these more intently. Among all the recipients who die after a liver transplant, almost half die within the first 10 years, and at least a third of those will be during the first year. The most common cause is recurrence of primary disease. This was specifically true with rampant HCV diagnosis, but this dynamic is changing and we will discuss that later. Next three most common causes are infections, de novo malignancies, and cardiovascular events. This is a graphical representation of the same data with additional note that infection is the leading cause during the first two years and de novo malignancies became the second highest cause by the fifth year of the transplant. Through the 10 years, a surviving recipient's profile changes and they acquire a significant set of long-term complications. About half are overweight, close to a third are obese and diabetic. Nearly half have dyslipidemia while a third have renal insufficiency. Very dramatically, 75% develop arterial hypertension and more than 90% have at least one cardiovascular risk factor. This graph, complications, this graph of complication related outcome after 10 years shows a dramatic rise in risk of malignancies and cardiovascular events. So what can we change to make things better? Good news is that most major change in outcome is already underway. Effective cures of treatment of HCV with directly acting antiviral agents have dramatically changed the landscape for these patients. Many are surviving longer, even on wait list, as evident in the set of graph on your right, where the lower survival for HCC, um, so, sorry, uh, for low survival for HCV patients on patient wait list now equals those for other indications for liver transplant. Similarly, on your right, um, after the transplant, the graft and patient survival for HCV related ASCLD now matches outcome for other pathologies. An interesting related dynamic is the reduction in incidence of acute cellular rejection in patients treated for HCV with directly acting agents instead of interferon after the transplant, leading to an improved survival. This 
Ex the explanation is obvious because interferon bolstered the immunity triggering rejection, but DAAs do not. There was some concern uh, in the early years of DAA therapy that uh, there was a higher recurrence of HCC after transplant uh, when these patients got treatment before transplant. But we have strong data now that probability of recurrence of HCC with transplant following treatment of HCV is lower than treatment naive patients, as is evident here, and even lower than interferon, as well as survival with HCC is much better than interferon patients. The second most common long-term problem is de novo malignancies, and based uh, on this study data spanning 28 years and more than 1,600 patients, overall incidence of these increases with duration of transplant. Solid organ tumors show the highest incidence followed by skin and hematological malignancies. Importantly, survival is worse with solid organ transplant followed by hematologic malignancy, and essentially there is no change in survival with skin cancers. Another important set of long-term complications are already, as already discussed, are metabolic syndromes, renal dysfunction, and cardiovascular events. With no prior history, nearly 20% of the patients experience uh, CVE, um, like in this series of 432 patients. Independent pred pred predictors related were de novo diabetes mellitus post-liver transplant, serum creatinine levels at one year, and de novo hypertension post-liver transplant. Dyslipidemia and serum creatinine levels are considered modifiable by regular screening, minimizing CNIs, adding mycophenolate to immunosuppression, and using statins. Looking again at the cumulative incidence of these long-term complications, one reality is very evident. These are the twine of the same rope. So nearly all these are the result of immunosuppression used long-term. The same immunosuppression that has helped improve early outcome is a bane of long-term outcome. It is obvious that minimizing the immunosuppression would help the cause, but in reality, there is a delicate balance in play with under suppression leading to chronic rejection and graft loss. And tipping the balance with over suppression leads to infections, malignancies, renal and metabolic derangements. You do not have large trials like symphony or diamond studies for kidney transplant immunosuppression guiding us, but based on the current prevalent opinion and the meta-analysis of 64 studies, mainstay still is tetralimus. Keeping a trough in a narrower band of four to eight after first one reduces renal dysfunction significantly without increasing the risk of acute cellular rejection. There is a small subset of about 20% patients who are older, not transplanted for autoimmune pathology, have no rejection up short for preceding years, and are many year post-transplant who may be candidates for immunosuppression withdrawal. So in conclusion, liver transplant, despite being resource intensive and complex, in execution leads to remarkable improvement in recipient survival. With more than half a century experience, we have achieved excellent short-term outcomes. Any further advancement is likely to come in small increments for this phase. Our progress on long-term outcomes have stalled for more than two decades. Our initial strategy for success based in large measure on immunosuppression sees into our long-term failure. Success is likely to come from breaking, breakthrough innovation rather than anything incremental we are using currently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aslan. It was a very informative presentation. Um, next, I would like to move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Khalid Mumtaz. Dr. Khalid Mumtaz, again, requires no introduction. He's well known to Pakistan, he's well known to Canada, and now he's well known to the USA as well. Um, he's had, uh, uh, I usually think of is that he's a clinician with his overexpression of research genes. So he's had a number of pl uh, publications again, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, a vast topic, which is immunotherapy, uh, I'm sorry, which is, a, uh, he's going to talk, talk about uh, managing recurrence of the primary etiologies after liver transplantation. So I would request uh, Dr. Khalid Umtaz to start his presentation. And again, uh, the questions are to be posted in the chat box. We'll take the questions after the presentations. <laughs> Hello, assalamu alaikum, and uh, good evening, because it's evening here in the United States at the moment. Uh, my name is Dr. Khalid Mumtaz. I'm working as an associate professor at Ohio State University. I'm also a director of research and director of live donor liver transplant program here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Pakistan Society for the study of liver disease for this kind invite.
I would like to thank Dr. Wasim Jafri, Dr. Saeed Hamid, uh, President of PSSLD, Dr. Zagam Abbas, and Dr. Amna Subhan for this invitation. The topic that I have to discuss today is about the management of recurrence of primary etiology after the liver transplantation. I do not have anything to disclose related to this presentation. So we know that liver transplantation recurs and it can recur after transplantation in certain etiologies and it doesn't recur with the other diseases. So the diseases where it, re it doesn't recur are fulmin and hepatic failure when the liver transplantation is done for hepatitis A or drug-induced liver injury. If a person undergoes liver transplantation for extrahepatic biliary atresia, then the chances of recurrence are almost negligible. Uh, this reminds me of a patient of mine who is 28 years old and she got her liver transplantation when she was six months old. So she's surviving for the last 27 years and her graft and uh, quality of life is excellent. Uh, benign tumors such as hepatic epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, large adenomas, when, they, uh, when the patient undergoes transplantation for these, they do not require a re-transplantation. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, Wilson disease, familial amyloidotic polyneuropathy are also indications where the patient do not require another transplantation because the chances of recurrence are zero. Similarly, ornithine aspartate deficiency and primary auxiliaria, which are very rare conditions, do not require another liver transplantation. However, there are diseases that recur after the liver transplantation and require uh, re-transplantation after progression of the disease. The, the one that I'm going to discuss today are uh, highlighted here in blue color, non-alcoholic fat liver disease, hepatitis B, C, autoimmune liver diseases, a little bit about alcoholic liver diseases. We know that HCC and cholangiocarcinoma can recur, but this is a topic on its own, so I'm not going to discuss these two, and hemochromatosis and butt carry syndrome can recur very rarely as well. The recurrence is increasing because of the fact that the survival after the liver transplantation is improving. As I mentioned to you that one of my patients has survived 27 years so far, and she is doing very well, and I'm expecting that she's going to survive for another 10, 20, or 30 years. Uh, there was a recent report published about three or four years ago where they talked about uh, 38 patients who have survived more than 40 years after the liver transplantation. So as the, uh, the survival after the transplantation is improving, the chances of recurrence are there as well. Recurrence is mostly divided into non-viral and the viral etiology among the non-viral are non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, autoimmune diseases and alcohol-related liver diseases. Among the viral, the most common are hepatitis B and hepatitis C virus-related recurrence. So let's talk about the most uh, growing and uh, important uh, disease which uh, we are seeing all around the world, that is NASH and its recurrence. Uh, recurrent NASH can occur post-liver transplantation and has been observed to be increasing. The principal factors that leads to the recurrence of the NASH are baseline metabolic comorbidities and worsening of the metabolic profile post-liver transplantation. The gold standard for the diagnosis of recurrence of NASH is a liver biopsy. However, non-invasive methods such as transient elastography and MR elastography are emerging techniques for the diagnosis of steatosis. Uh, let me review some of the recent studies published regarding uh, the outcomes of non-alcoholic fat liver disease and its recurrence. First study by Surya et al. Uh, has looked into re uh, 77 patients retrospectively and at one year they found that the recurrence of non-alcoholic fat liver disease was observed in more than half of the patients. 16% had moderate or severe steatosis, which means more than 33% steatosis. 6.8% had NASH with, non with the nephril activity score of more than 5. And 2.3% have advanced fibrosis that is stage more than 3 at one year. Another study by Bertie et al. where they studied 103 patients, 90% have recurrent non-alcoholic fat liver disease diagnosed histologically or with the help of transient elastography. Uh, 
the study which has uh, which is the largest so far by Kekar et al published in 2019 including 226 patients retrospectively followed and 49% of them develop recurrent NASH at an average of three years. In this study, they found that 15 bridging fibrosis were observed in six years and four NASH allograft cirrhosis were seen at nine years. So these studies are basically highlighting that 50%, almost 50% of the patient have recurrence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But luckily, the chances of development of cirrhosis are very, very low and the cases of re liver transplantation for uh, recurrence of NASH is something very, very uncommon. There are certain risk factors which leads to the recurrence of the NASH and uh, they include, not surprisingly, obesity or BMI at or after the liver transplantation. Another factor pointed out is post liver transplant weight gain, which is usually seen at three to six months after the transplantation presence of the metabolic syndrome in the form of hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia also leads to recurrence and de novo non-alcoholic fat liver disease. Other risk factors are older age at the time of liver transplantation with the presence of metabolic syndrome. Women are more prone as compared to men. Certain genes have correlation with the steatosis such as PNPLA3. There is controversy about the use of the induction and immunosuppression uh, to avoid recurrent NASH, but majority of the literature is in favor of going for steroid-free induction or short duration of steroids in order to avoid the recurrence of NASH. There is conflicting data on type of the calcineurin inhibitor and recurrence of NASH. In one study, they reported that tacrolimus as a risk factor for de novo NASH, whereas others do not find uh, significant differences in the tacrolimus as compared to the cyclosporin group. There is at least one study which suggested that everolimus has been associated with less weight gain, but no reduction in the NASH post liver transplantation has been reported in that study. The gold standard for diagnosis of recurrent NASH according to the ASLD guidelines 2018 is a liver biopsy. Among other modalities, MRI and MRE are better than ultrasound or CT scan. It has a sensitivity and specificity of 90 and 91 percent respectively. The newer modalities and uh, cost-effective modalities are liver stiffness measurement with the help of transient elastography for graft steatosis although in the post-transplant setting, it needs further validation. What is the impact of recurrent NASH on the liver transplant survival? There's limited data on the impact of NASH on post-liver transplant survival at the moment. One study involving 588 liver transplant recipients, 9.4% had NASH post-liver transplant allograft steatosis was not associated with survival in this study. Worst outcomes shown in patients who were transplanted for NASH-related HCC. Therefore, further prospective study is generated would be prudent to assume that survival is not affected by recurrent NASH. This is a algorithm for the implication and approach to recurrent non-alcoholic fat liver disease. So when you see a patient pre-transplantation uh, with NASH, uh, you have to find out the risk factors which may be modifiable and non-modifiable. The modifiable risk factors are lifestyle. You have to plan for an immunosuppression, which uh, may be helpful, particularly the steroid-free or short course of steroid immediately after the transplantation. Metabolic syndrome control and weight gain control is very helpful. However, unfortunately, as the patients are very sick, mm -hmm. They are unable to undergo uh, weight uh, control. There are some studies where they have used bariatric surgery along with the liver transplantation. However, because of the complication, it is not a, a, a very common uh, pathway uh, during the liver transplantation. Post liver transplantation, in order to find out recurrence of the uh, NASH, which uh, you can see with the previous slides, is about 50%. You have to be vigilant and uh, plan for invasive tests such as liver biopsy or transient elastography or MRI. Unfortunately, at the moment, the pharmacotherapy, which has been used in NASH,
in the pre-transplant group has not been used in the post-transplant setting. What you have to focus is the preventive measures and you have to uh, change the lifestyle of the patient. You have to control the metabolic syndrome of the patient as well. Now let's switch gear to hepatitis B virus recurrence. This is, I'm sure, is still one of the most common cause of uh, transplantation in Pakistan. So it is defined as reappearance of hepatitis B surface antigen and or HBV DNA in patients on antiviral therapy who initially had clearance of this marker. There was an error prior to the discovery of antiviral therapy and hepatitis B immunoglobulin, where liver transplantation was challenging at many centers prior to 1998. Later on with the hepatitis B immunoglobulin and lamovidine, liver transplantation has become successful in the setting of hepatitis B. In the post antiviral therapy and hepatitis B, hepatitis B immunoglobulin era, aim is to suppress the HBV DNA prior to the liver transplantation and continue it afterward. Hepatitis B immunoglobulin is used to neutralize the hepatitis B virus particle and hepatitis B surface antigen in certain situations, which I'm going to discuss in next slides. Recurrence rate is reduced to less than 10% at two years in the lamovidine and edophover era. And in the res recent era of use of antiquaver and, ten and tenofovir, it is further reduced. Let me review some of the studies uh, related to the use of nukes and hepatitis B immunoglobulin. This is a study by Beck, Beckebaum, included 371 patients with a median follow-up of 78 months. In this study, they have used lamivudine or lamivudine along with adifover. 101 out of 239 patients have detectable HBV and DNA at the time of liver transplantation. These patients were treated with hepatitis B immunoglobulin at various uh, protocols, and they found that the recurrence of hepatitis B was seen on, in only 4.3% of the patients. Another study, which is one of the largest so far, uh, is, uh, has suggested that uh, that included actually 5,333 5, total patients in group A. They have 4,684 patients who receive hepatitis B immunoglobulin and LAM. In group B, 491 patients received HBIG plus antiquaver. In group C, 158 patients receive HBIG and antiquaver. Median follow-up was 42 months. Uh, and group A, there were 1,024 patients who have HBV DNA positive in group B and group C, there were 40 and 17 patients respectively. These patients received hepatitis B immunoglobulin according to this protocol. And at five years, group A has only 4.7% recurrence. Group B, which included the newer antiviral antiquaver, has only 1.5% recurrence and group C has 4.4% recurrence. So you can see that with the help of hepatitis B immunoglobulin and the newer antiviral therapy, you can reduce the recurrence of hepatitis B in the post-transplant setting to less than 1.5%. This is the protocol that we follow here at our transplant center in our patients who have hepatitis B, although we rarely see hepatitis B-related liver failure here, but uh, we do see at least uh, two, five to 10 every year. And uh, this is the protocol that we follow. Uh, when the patient is known to have hepatitis B, our aim is to put them on the antiviral and check their HBV DNA at the time of liver transplantation. If their HBV DNA is undetectable, they have a different protocol. If their HBV DNA is detectable, it's different. In cases where HBV DNA is undetectable, these patients are continued on antiquaver or tenofovir without hepatitis B immunoglobulin indefinitely. With those who have HBV DNA detectable, we see the levels of HBV DNA if it is less than 2,000 and they have no uh, uh, risk factors such as drug resistant hepatitis B, HIV, co-infection hepatitis delta, HCC. In that case, we continue them on antiquaver and tenofovir and rarely consider them for the hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Those who have uh, the risk factors or those who have HBV DNA of more than 2,000 international unit, these patients receive hepatitis B immunoglobulin according to a set protocol where we give it uh, daily for seven days. 
weekly for three weeks and then monthly uh, for the rest of their life along with antiquaver or tenofovir. However, we continue to check their HBV, DNA, PCR and hepatitis B surface antigen uh, before hepatitis B immunoglobulin monthly and discontinue very rarely if they uh, clear their hepatitis B surface antigen and their HBV DNA is negative. And now let's talk about hepatitis C recurrence. In the pre-DAA era, hepatitis C recurrence was almost universal. As you can see, cirrhosis uh, uh, recurrence at five years was seen in almost 90 to 95% of the patient. 20 to 40% of the patients would develop cirrhosis at one year. The diagnosis uh, in those era was based upon the hep C PCR and liver pathology and liver pathology was very challenging because of a lot of overlapping features of acute cellular rejection. The treatment efficacy with the help of pegylator interferon and ribavirin was at best 20 to 30% across all genotype. We have a chance to look at to, into the outcomes of liver transplantation <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, in patients with genotype 3 and their treatment. We uh, reported 52 patients with genotype 3 and their uh, experience with the pegylator interferon. And you can see that a lot of patients were unable to continue the treatment. Dose reduction was very common and mortality was observed in about eight of our patients. However, despite all that, after 36 weeks of treatment, we were able to find that 71% of the patients with genotype 3 were able to clear hepatitis C. And this survival curve has shown that SVR has an improved impact on the survival as well. In the post-DAA era, the situation is almost uh, revolutionized. It's almost it's very, very different. DAA have revolutionized the treatment of hepatitis C. Patients can be treated uh, for hepatitis C while on the wait list for the transplant. So even those who are decompensated can get the treatment. Patients can be treated immediately after the liver transplantation. Sustained virological response in the post DAA era is more than 95%. And uh, it is uh, it has resulted into 30% decrease in the number of the liver transplant performed for patients with hepatitis C in the United States. GAF survival in HCV patients now comparable to that observed in non-HCV recipients. HCV positive donor graft are used for HCV positive as an even HCV negative recipient in the current era because of the fact that we have a very, very effective treatment available. Now let's switch gear uh, from the viral to the autoimmune etiology. The three most common autoimmune diseases are PBC, autoimmune hepatitis, and PSC. These are the diagnostic criteria for the three entities. And if you look at the recurrence of uh, liver disease in patients with the autoimmune disease, it is more most common in patients who undergo, uh, undergo liver transplantation for autoimmune hepatitis, which is shown here in the red line, followed by PBC, and the best outcome is with the, uh, the outcome with the PBC and PSC is almost similar. Recurrent autoimmune hepatitis, a few facts, 4 to 6% of the liver transplant in the United States are perform is performed because of the underlying autoimmune liver diseases. Autoimmune hepatitis can present with acute liver failure and according to the ALF-SG group, 18% of their ac acute hepatitis have underlying autoimmune liver disease. 90% and 72% is the survival rate at one year and five years. Recurrent autoimmune hepatitis is seen in 17 to 40% within five years and it can be seen as early as within a month. There are certain risk factors which you have to look into when you're offering uh, liver transplant to, for autoimmune hepatitis. The pre-liver transplant risk factors are genotype, HLA, mismatching at the liver transplant, and active autoimmune hepatitis at the time of liver transplantation. You cannot control the genotype and the HLA mismatching, but you can attempt to control the active autoimmune hepatitis if possible. Post-liver transplantation, Factors that can lead to recurrent autoimmune hepatitis are lower immunosuppressive levels. So as we uh, know that autoimmune hepatitis uh, patient uh, are younger, they have more chances of recurrence and uh, even rejection. 
we have to maintain them at a higher end of uh, levels in the first uh, one year of the transplantation between eight to 10, uh, level of tacrolimus between eight to 10, and then the rap rapid tapering of the steroid can lead to the recurrence and discontinuation of the steroid also can lead to recurrence. So we have to be very careful with the tapering of the steroid in patient with the autoimmune hepatitis. The diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis is based upon the histology. It shows interface hepatitis. It also shows mononuclear inflammatory infiltrate with the plasma cells. Serology of the autoimmune hepatitis, such as uh, anti-smooth muscle antibody, is not helpful in this situation. Diagnosis has to be, certain diagnosis needs to be excluded, such as acute cellular rejection and drug-induced liver injury. Management of acute uh, re re recurrent autoimmune hepatitis is based upon the use of corticosteroids, high levels of immunosuppression. Some studies suggest that adding imuran along with the calcineurin inhibitor may be helpful. Long-term dose of low, long-term use of low dose prednisone is very helpful. One is study by Krishna Murthy, which was published in liver transplantation in 2016, has addressed the use of low dose steroid in the uh, such as prednisone 2.5 to 5 milligram and they have reported that its use for longer duration is helpful in avoiding the recurrence of autoimmune hepatitis it has also provided survival benefit and it is safe in uh, terms of producing osteoporosis now let's talk about the PBC recurrence. Uh, uh, the, rec the listing of the PBC is based upon the MALDE score. Post liver transplant outcomes of 90%, 83% at one year and five years. Uh, recurrent PBC is seen in about four to 33% of the population at about five years of interval after the transplantation. Less than 5% of the recurrent PBC develop cirrhosis rarely it requires a re liver transplantation the risk factors for the recurrence include donor age older the donor more chances of recurrence similarly older the recipient more chances of recurrence uh, warm ischemia time also plays role and then there <clears throat> is at least some evidence about the type of immunosuppressant new burger in liver transplantation in 2004 studied the effects of immunosuppression at the rate of the recurrent PBC and he found that the recurrent uh, recurrence of the PBC was more common in the group which was uh, given tacrolimus as compared to cyclosporin. However, the studies after that were unable to uh, prove the efficacy of one uh, entire rejection against another and in this study Neuberger was unable to find any causality of tacrolimus in the recurrence as well. <clears throat> so at the moment, uh, majority of the centers use tacrolimus uh, for the control of prolonged immunosuppression. The diagnosis of recurrent uh, primary biliary cirrhosis is based upon uh, liver biopsy. Again, anti-mitochondrial antibody is not diagnostic in the post-transplant setting. Management is based upon the use of also deoxycholic acid and in the previous studies, it has been uh, shown that it is useful in improving the biochemistry, but survival is not certain. In a very, very recent study, which was published in Journal of Hepatology last month, 2020, <coughs> uh, Cor Picot has uh, studied 780 patients. Uh, these patients belong to the European population and uh, 590 patients did not receive UDCA and 190 patients did receive UDCA. The primary outcome they looked into was recurrent PBC, secondary outcome was graft loss, liver-related death and all-cause death. They found that use of UDCA was helpful in reducing the recurrence of the PB PBC in about 59% of the uh, reduction by 59%. They also found that use of UDCA was associated with the 54% uh, lesser liver-related death. And finally, they found that the use of UDCA was associated with 67% less graft loss as compared to not using UDCA. So based upon this strong evidence, uh, 
I would suggest uh, to use UDCA in patients who are transplanted for PBC for a longer duration in order to avoid the recurrence of the PBC, uh, improve survival and improve graft survival. Uh, now talk about the PSC. Uh, it is a strongly associated with IBD in about 60 to 80% of the patient. Uh, usually the patient needs liver transplantation when they have recurring cholangitis, intractable pruritus, and development of cholangiocarcinoma. One and five year patient survival has been reported to be 90 and 80%. And one and five year graft survival has been reported to be 84 and 75%. Uh, recurrence rate is reported to be 8.6 to 37% at, at, at as early as six months to five years. There are certain risk factors which can lead to the recurrence, such as younger age of the recipient, history of recurrent acute cellular rejection, acute cellular rejection requiring chronic steroids, liver transplantation for cholangiocarcinoma. In one study from Japan, they have reported that live donor liver transplantation from first degree relative is also a risk factor for the recurrence. However, the A2ALL study from North America did not find this relationship. The recurrent PBC is usually diagnosed with the help of Mayo criteria, which includes a previous diagnosis of PSC cholangiogram showing strictures, ble bleeding. Liver biopsy usually shows fibrous cholangitis with or without ductopenia. Management of the recurrent PB PSC is similar to the pre-liver transplantation. If these patients have recurring episodes of cholangitis, then you treat it with the antibiotic. You use antibiotic prophylaxis for three to six months. Dominant biliary strictures are usually dealt with ERCP. Biliary strictures should be excluded for cholangiocarcinoma. UDCA, which is helpful in PBC, it has not proven to have any role in survival benefit. Now I will talk very quickly about the alcoholic liver disease. Uh, the recurrence rate uh, varies depending upon the uh, uh, upon various factors. Uh, however, in multiple studies, no association has been found with the six month abstinence, which is a rule uh, applicable at most of the transplant center before offering a liver transplantation. However, studies showed that social support availability and the completion of alcohol anonymous treatment prior to the liver transplantation is helpful. Diagnosis is based upon the history of recidivism. There is a test called as a PETH test, which is done on blood. It can detect the phosphatidyl uh, ethanol, and it can. Uh, uh, it, it, this test is very helpful in people who are denying uh, the intake of alcohol. This test can actually detect if somebody has history of if somebody has drank in last one month. So we use this test very frequently and able to find out if the patient is lying to us. Liver biopsy usually shows features of steatosis, malarating bodies, and the features are similar to non-alcoholic fat liver disease, but this PET test is usually very helpful. Management, uh, we usually do not allow any amount of alcohol in these patients after the liver transplantation. Social support is usually very helpful. Uh, on each and every visit after the transplantation, our focus is on the importance of the abstinence to these patients. In the end, I would like to conclude that recurrence of the primary disease in the graft is not uncommon. However, fortunately, recurrence leading to cirrhosis and requiring liver transplantation is uncommon. Recurrent NASH is expected to be a serious issue in the future. Recurrent hepatitis B virus is associated with resistance to the antiviral therapy. It is very uncommon with the newer antiviral therapies such as anticaver and tenofovir. Direct acting antiviral has changed the horizon of recurrent hepatitis C virus infection. Among autoimmune diseases, autoimmune hepatitis recurs most commonly. Effective control of the primary disease is the key in the graft and patient survival. With that, I would like to end my presentation and again, thanks Pakistan Society for the study of liver disease to give me an opportunity of talking on their uh, annual conference and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid. It was a very informative presentation. Indeed, it is a big issue that needs to, uh, to be further clarified and has to be followed again. Um, now we move on to our next talk. It is an honor for me to introduce uh, our next speaker.
Oh, uh, Dr. Rela, he's a world renowned liver transplant surgeon. He had been a professor in the United Kingdom and now he's uh, the head of the largest liver transplant center in South Asia. He uh, is definitely world renowned and requires uh, a lot more time for his proper introduction. He's uh, had a number of research publications, more than 450 uh, uh, publications done. And uh, he's, in fact, the next president-elect of the International Liver Transplant Society. These are just small things. Uh, I, I think he's been a great mentor. And uh, the liver transplant program in Pakistan definitely has um, a, a, a huge uh, benefit from him because he was the one who had mentored a lot of people including uh, people who started the liver transplant program in Pakistan. So uh, f next, uh, moving on forward, I would like, uh, without sp uh, wasting more time, I would like Dr. Rayla to uh, take on the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I say, say, share my slides and um, do it, or you're going to run it from your side? Uh, I, can, oh, I can do it. OK, that's great. So you oh, can that's fantastic. Mm. Uh, thank you. This is a very broad subject, and I don't want to go into individual um, uh, disease processes and uh, go into all of those. Um, this is about challenges in decision making, when to transplant and when not to transplant. Um, so I'll broadly touch really decompensated chronic liver disease, ACLF and um, ALF. I know Faisal Dar spoke about transplantation for ACLF. Uh, maybe two or three slides, maybe a repetition there. Now, the decision when to transplant, when not to transplant, I think um, in my younger days, people used to say as a surgeon, you learn um, when to do surgery for the first 10 years of your career, and then when, how to do surgery takes another 10 years, and then the final 10 years is when you learn when not to do surgery. I think we often make mistakes in when not to do transplants rather than uh, the clear-cut uh, definitions of when to do transplant. The risk of really sorry, the risk of too early transplantation is obviously, particularly in ACLF and ALF, losing the opportunity for spontaneous recovery, and then probably shortening their life expectancy. Somebody who doesn't have a high mortality at one year could potentially really have uh, have the surgery done and die prematurely. Uh, the risk of uh, too late a transplant, obviously, is transplanting somebody too sick and having a mortality because you're transplanting them too sick and also um, listing them in a cadaver list and losing them on the waiting list are the issues. Um, now, really conventionally, in the early days, before I'm even talking about uh, pre meld era, a lot of these decision-making was very subjective. And I wouldn't say that was a bad way of really, it was good clinical science, uh, you transplant patients with intractable ascites, um, deep jaundice, recurrent bleeding, which is not which is not controlled by uh, medical means, as well as uh, encephalopathy. But um, once uh, once it is subjective in the earlier spectrum of the disease, it becomes very difficult when to transplant, and there is a risk of transplanting patients uh, very early in the course of uh, their illness. Now, which is why really the minimal listing criteria came about, the UNOS criteria came about, and finally the MEL criteria, which still holds good, uh, came about for deciding to transplant patients. And the minimal listing criteria really was not so stringent at all. I mean, the estimated one year survival is just than 90%. One would actually suggest transplantation for them. Um, can you mute all other things? I'm hearing people talking in the background. Can the organizers unmute, please, the other others? Other speakers? Yes. Uh, the next came really the UNOS classification. And uh, in this, I would like to um, really focus on status three, where uh, the C CTP, um, the child peer score of greater than seven, without any complications of cirrhosis. And these patients, unless you give them priority for the number of uh, years they waited, they're unlikely to get transplanted. So generally, a minimum CTP score of um, seven or greater than seven with complications of cirrhosis was thought to be uh, an indication for transplantation. And now the MEL data came, and I think most people now follow the MEL calculations. This is um, this is a, a calculated MEL. It's not a straightforward calculation. You need a calculator for that, based on serum, creatinine, bilirubin, and INR. Uh, 
there are many negative sides to this, but in spite of that, I think MELD has been very good in predicting mortality before transplant, and MELD has also been good for predicting mortality after transplant. If you see here a MELD of uh, 0 to 10, where the one-year survival is greater than 97%, obviously will not be a candidate for liver transplant, and that's helped enormously in listing. And there has been an impressive decrease in the, mor in the mortality on the waiting list when you give priority for high MELD patients, and there has also been a reduction in the number of patients listed for transplantation uh, after the MELD uh, came into really usage. And, and I think even though uh, there are many disadvantages to MELD, I think it still does hold good for many of the diseases. Uh, there have been many modifications of MELD and the UK have their own um, a system called U, uh, UKELD and um, people have added sodium to make MELD more accurately. Um, the disadvantages obviously are it's very heavily um, uh, dependent on the serum creatinine level and serum bilirubin level. You have situations where patients have underlying chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, where the MELD may be spuriously high. And also you have situations where the cholestatic liver diseases like PBC and PSC, where the bilirubins are very high and uh, the sickness uh, when in these, in these uh, patients, the MELD may not be a true reflection of how sick they are. So these are limitations to, for MELD. Um, the other limitations for MELD is really patients with um, bacterial peritonitis, refractory ascites, um, as well as hepatopulmonary syndrome uh, and portopulmonary hypertension. In these patients, the MELD may be very low, but patients may be very sick. And generally, most systems give them MELD exception points for these or special situations where these can be listed and transplanted. So MELD is not perfect, but I think it still is uh, very good uh, in uh, really uh, uh, finding out which are the patients who are going to die if you don't transplant them in a timely manner. And also, really, when you look at the survival benefit of liver transplantation, when you transplant patients with very low MELD, uh, again, it is a disadvantage for patients, and you can see in this study where low MEL transplantation, the risk of mortality of transplantation itself has a hazard ratio of three to four when you transplant them uh, earlier, therefore uh, preventing people from getting transplant where with very low MEL. Now, so this is uh, really the concluding slide. You, you could use MEL, which is useful for both uh, assessing pre-transplant mortality as well as post-transplant mortality. And if it is used judiciously, I think you would be able to transplant the right patients using that. Now, uh, ACLF, I just uh, put a few um, slides because um, one of the difficulties of, um, I think in the chronic liver disease, at least uh, you can actually decide when to transplant uh, in a more accurate manner, but in the acute liver failure group and in the ACLF group, it's much more difficult when to transplant and when not to transplant. Um, actually, in 1997, the, ACL, the ASLD guidelines clearly thought that ACLF should be a contraindication for liver transplantation because the outcome was very poor in the early days. But now, I think with better understanding of ACLF, with LDLT, the Eastern Centers pushing a transplantation for ACLF, the outcome has been really good um, for, uh, for transplantation for ACLF. And if you look at one of the difficulties about deciding transplantation of ACLF is, is a dynamic uh, process and patients very often improve. And um, there is an element of reversibility in ACLF in almost 30 to 40% of patients. So it's not easy to offer transplantation for all patients with ACLF. And let's see who are the patients who should be offered them. And now the, the world is split into two really in terms of definition for ACLF. The, the East is um, led really by the Apostle Group and um, the West uh, led by the Canonic Group. And uh, they're, they're, they are actually differing in definitions itself. And when, when you call somebody ACLF itself is really so varied between the East and West. I think the, the, the Eastern countries uh, led by Apostle uh, calls uh, a, a ACLF slightly earlier than the easel criteria for ACLF. And there are some advantages in the apostle definition, I feel, uh, for um, deciding transplantation for ACLF. Now, this is where it is, the apostle, there is a slight window of opportunity where you can assess them. Whereas 
in the easel group, they have to have really uh, one, at least one organ failure before you can call them ACLF. And, and the time that you have uh, once they fulfill criteria for ACLF is uh, less in the in the easel than it is in the apostle. Um, and uh, it's very much really the post the mortality of ACLF very much decides on the number of uh, organ failures. And once um, the organ failure reaches two, and if it is more than three, if it is more than three organ failures, you almost have a 28 day mortality of almost 80% or 90%. And therefore, I think now, once you see this, then you can decide which patients are going to require early transplantation. And all of the calculations that we're going to see are going to depend on how many organ failures are there. And in the canonic study, the, the, the difficulty is this. And uh, I think this table is, I always find a very useful table. When you have uh, admission um, ACLF criteria, ACLF one and two, and when you follow them up for three to seven days, you'll find that ACLF three and ACLF two, the, sur the survival may be very poor. But when you, when you have ACLF one, almost half of them have no ACLF at the end of seven days. So there is a 50% improvement within seven days when they have ACLF1. And this is where decision-making very early in ACLF is very difficult. You have to watch them because this is a very dynamic process. And you make a decision to transplant really one week after admission and you see if there is regression or progression and then make a decision to transplant. And this is the survival curve, obviously, for um, the AC, no ACLF, ACLF 1, 2, and 3 in the canonic study. And obviously, the survival is very good when there is no ACLF or when there is ACLF 1. But when there is ACLF 2 and the ACLF 3, the survival is extremely poor. And if you just look at the bottom two curves, and if you transplant them, the bottom two curves without transplantation, the, the curve remains at the bottom. Whereas if you transplant the bottom two curves, then it's pushed equal into really no ACLF. So transplantation definitely improves the outlook of ACLF2 and ACLF3. So it's very clearly indicated for ACLF2 and ACLF3. Apostel came with this ARC um, scoring system for deciding transplantation, and they also graded them um, there it is, depending on the number of organ failure, ACLF 1, 2, and 3. And here it is graded according to the ARC scoring system. And they graded them into grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. And grade 3 here had a 28-day 28 28-day mortality of um, 80%, which is very grade 3 is somewhat equal to ACLF 3 in the canonic study. Um, and similarly, grade 2 is uh, very similar to the um, ACLF 2 in the canonic study. And here again, what they have suggested, if it is grade one, it is potentially recoverable. We saw only 50% is recoverable. I think you need to watch and see how they progress. And if it is grade two, uh, it requires intensive monitoring and deciding transplant. And if it is grade three, obviously it requires immediate intervention for transplantation. And that's where the assessment is the first week is very important uh, time required for making an assessment of whether ACLF is going to improve, deteriorate, um, or whether you need to do an urgent transplant. And uh, the Apostle study uh, is very useful where they say the transplant window is one week because they claim that majority of more than 50% of the mortality of ACLF happens in the first 28 days. A lot of them will die in the first week itself, and that will be futile to try and transplant them. And number two, majority of the patients are sick at the time and recover or improve by day seven to be suitable for transplant. And maximum resolution of sepsis also happens in the first week. And if you wait, why don't you then wait longer? If you wait for more than seven days, then the chances of multi-organ failure death also increases after seven days. So they believe that the first seven days is absolutely important in decision making. So it's not like acute liver failure where you make a decision at one point. I think even that thinking is changing. So when the ARC score is less than 10, you see, wait and see if their score increases by two points in the first week. And if the ARC score is, ARC, ARC score is more than 11, wait and see if they achieve it. So that is, uh, that is about ACLF and transplantation.
Um, and there is also uh, the futility criteria for ACLF. And once these patients have uncontrolled sepsis, or there is an increase in creatinine of more than 300% within the first week of admission, or when they require, when they have ARDS, or they have four organ failure and hemodynamic instability requiring more than three milligrams per hour of noradrenaline, these would be, or actively bleeding patients would be really up to absolute contraindication for transplanting ACLF patients. Now, just a few slides about um, transplantation for ALF and when not to and when to. I think in the early days of transplantation, the survival of medical management of ACLF was extremely poor and liver transplantation was thought to be an absolute indication for ALF when they fulfill criteria. And there were many, many criteria which came into use. Uh, and the most popular and well-known of this criteria is O'Grady King's College Hospital criteria. And uh, does this criteria still hold good for transplantation for ACLF? Uh, there is some doubt thrown by the King's College Hospital group itself. I mean, I worked in King's College for almost 25 years. Now, with good ICU care and with good medical management, we are seeing that a lot of what was what was indication for transplantation is there is there seems to be a spontaneous recovery, and this is particularly so for pregnancy-related acute liver failure, as well as the hyperacute liver failure due to paracetamol overdose. Uh, the paracetamol overdose over the over the period of time, you can see that a majority of them will recover without transplantation and therefore really that throws some doubt as to the king's college has hospital criteria for the acetaminophen poisoning and if you look at uh, the over the over the period the baseline period which is before 1993 and the the period of the study which is 2004 to 2008 when you look at all patients with uh, acute liver failure whether they are transplanted or um, transplanting or not, there has been a significant improvement in the outcome of acute liver failure. When you look at grade, more than grade one acute liver failure, that has also improved. The transplantation of acute liver failure has also improved. I mean, that, that, that improvement is not huge because uh, even before 1993, the outcome of transplantation has been greater than 60%, and now it's greater than 80%. The transplantation for acute liver failure has improved. But what is most significant is the non-transplant outcome of acute liver failure has significantly improved. What was about 16.7% before 1993, the non-transplant survival has improved to almost 48, 50%. So 50% of patients will recover without liver transplantation with acute liver failure. So that really puts a lot of doubts into uh, the criteria which were established 20 years ago, 25 years ago for transplantation for acute liver failure. And this, these reasoning have been brought out very clearly by the King's College Hospital Group. And these are all have to do with early transfer to a liver center, liver transplant center, and really active management of these patients in a liver transplant center to an extent that a lot of these patients who would be considered for transplantation in the past do not require. And that really relates to, I think, mainly the uh, the paracetamol overdose as well as uh, the pregnancy-related uh, liver diseases. But when you look at the indeterminate etiology or the non-A, non-B um, liver failure, acute liver failure, or seronegative liver failure, there has not been much improvement in the outcome. And if you look at the era of, um, in, in the era of um, transplantation, uh, there hasn't been a huge improvement in the non-transplant survival for the seronegative hepatitis compared to the other indications. And therefore, I think currently, if you look at the King's College Hospital criteria, the acetaminophen um, may have a, a huge um, um, uh, modifications to make, whereas in the non-acetaminophen group, I think the King's College Hospital criteria still holds good and and this is a study which very clearly states that for the non-acetaminophen acute liver failure, the criteria of King's College Hospital still holds very, very firmly uh, a good criteria to follow. Uh, it's been well time tested and, um, and what we need to do is really, instead of a single point criteria for acute liver failure, 
we need to be thinking about dynamic assessment also in acute liver failure, like in subacute liver failure for transplantation. Um, when not to proceed for transplant in acute liver failure is very similar to acute on chronic liver failure, really old age, severe sepsis requiring high inotropes, uh, neurological issues, fixed dilated pupil for more than four hours. I mean, there have been case reports of transplantation with fixed dilated pupils for even 12 hours with improvement. But in general terms, uh, if there is evidence of coming, I think transplantation is contraindication for acute liver failure. And this slide really summarizes when you should really proceed straight away when criteria is fulfilled and the criteria holds good over a period of time and when one has to wait. Um, and this primarily is for really the hyperacutes where you may want to wait uh, where the hyperacutes have not reached the three, grade three to four encephalopathy, paracetamol overdose, all of these where the serum lactate levels improve with resuscitation you might want to wait and the final slide here the decision making when to stop uh, when transplantation is futile which is very similar to what i said in the earliest uh, earlier so i think the decision to stop transplantation when you're already working up a patient particularly uh, in cadaver transplantation obviously you can delist them whereas when you're actually working up a living donor uh, and to come and say to the family uh, it is not the right time to transplant is a much, much more difficult decision uh, because many people will want to just go ahead. I think final slides, two slides, I just want to say that LDLT um, has actually made life easier for decision making for acute liver failure than in DDLT. Uh, I said you need to have a dynamic approach to acute liver failure transplantation also. So supposing somebody fulfills the criteria for transplantation and then you wait for an organ for two to three days and you get an organ, a DDLT, and you think that the patient is improving. Do you actually use the organ or you say, oh, the patient seems to be improving? No. And two days later, if you turn down this organ and two days later... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll finish with that conversation. Why don't you do it like this so that nobody gets tripped through that? All right, that's muted now. Um, so it's, it's very difficult in the DDLT setting when an organ is offered for patient listed for DDLT to turn down the organ for improvement. You, it may be easier to turn down the organ because the patient's deteriorated, but it's much more difficult to turn down the organ when patient is improving because you may not get the chance of an organ once again. Here is where really the LDLT uh, facilitates all this. You have a patient worked up and the donor is ready. And if there is improvement, you can always give them the opportunity to see if they will improve. And if they don't improve, you can proceed with the LDLT. Um, finally, really uh, pushing this even further, I've had uh, in meetings where people say, why wait for patients to fulfill criteria when you have a LDLT? Why don't you preemptively transplant these patients? I think that would be uh, that would be a wrong move, really, because with acute liver failure, especially, um, one needs to be sure that this patient's mortality would be high without transplantation. And therefore, I would never recommend a preemptive transplantation in the LDLT setting. I don't know if this happens, but there is always this discussions that I feel uncomfortable about where people say, why don't we preemptively transplant because it is acute liver failure. If they deteriorate, why do the transplant after they have deteriorated? I think one needs to worry about unnecessary risk to the donor, unnecessary immunosuppression lifelong for the recipient, as well as the risk of transplantation for the recipient before making such decisions. I think I finish here and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I know Faisal, I don't know if Faisal is there, but I saw Jangam Abbas there. Um, 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 he's been communicating with me and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much Dr. Ayla. Uh, indeed it's a, a very informative presentation again. Um, we've got a lot of questions uh, from our panel box. We'll start off with Dr. Ayla himself. Well, we've got a question, uh, what do we do for acute liver failure with alcohol related liver failure? Uh, 
If uh, I don't think there is um, an acute liver failure in alcohol. I think um, it is um, ACLF when it is um, uh, alcohol, really. You're talking about acute alcoholic hepatitis. Yeah. I think there are many, many studies uh, for uh, the benefic benefits of um, transplantation for acute alcoholic uh, um, hepatitis or ACLF due to alcohol. Um, and I think that has been, it, it used to be a contraindication for liver transplant, but now it's come well within the criteria for transplantation. Right. Thank and you, the Ryan. outcomes also good now. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question. I had a slide on that, but I didn't want to cover individual etiologies. I can keep talking about malignancies, newer indications in malignancies, you know, alcohol, but um, I don't see the point. I just wanted to keep my talk as a general talk for liver disease and liver failure. For the next question is for Dr. Khalid Mumtaz. Um, it's regarding use of SGPT2 GLP in inhibitors like uh, for his for recurrent NASH in patients who've got diabetes and then subsequently NASH related post liver transplant. Uh, thank you, Atif, for this question. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Khalid, we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Yeah, I think you guys have to allow. Uh, yeah, I think you guys have to allow my video. So if you can hear me, the question is about the GLP-1 inhibitor in the post-liver transplant setting to avoid the recurrence of NASH. So to my knowledge, there isn't any study actually uh, which is addressing the reduction of recurrent NASH with the use of GLP-1 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I don't have any personal experience of using GLP-1 inhibitor. The main aim in the post-liver transplant setting must be to control diabetes. So if for the control of diabetes you are using GLP-1 or SGPT inhibitor, that's definitely reasonable. Uh, there are some studies on the uh, uh, de novo NASH uh, control with the help of uh, GLP-1 inhibitors, and the results are not very convincing at the moment. Recently, I was involved in a uh, market scan-based database where we have looked into the role of GLP-1 inhibitor in patients who have uh, cirrhosis because of NASH. And we looked into the outcomes of decompensation and mortality in the group which was using GLP-1 as compared to the group which was not using. So we found that GLP-1 use was not associated with reduction in the decompensation and it has no effect on the survival as well. So at the moment, there isn't any consensus about using GLP-1 in the de novo NASH, neither in the post-liver transplant setting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Another question uh, that has been posted is the use of TAF and TDF post-liver transplant because conventionally, previously, uh, Intagavir is uh, the first line. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, TAF or, or tenofovir alafenamide has benefit that it has less side effects as compared to tenofovir dispoxival. So uh, its use is definitely more helpful in control of hepatitis B as well as avoiding the uh, complications related to tenofovir dispoxival. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Next, we have a question for Dr. Bilal. Um, the question is, are the neurological side effects of cyclosporin dose dependent or uh, how will we def uh, how different would you manage patients who are difficult to wake up persistent PSC or stroke early after treatment? Uh, that's a, a really uh, good question. Um, so there are many factors that are associated with uh, calcineurin neurotoxicity, whether it's cyclosporin or tacrolimus. Uh, these are very lipophilic uh, compounds attached to the cholesterol. And one of the things is that if you have low cholesterol, it's one of those factors that we always worry about. Uh, it can be associated even with therapeutic level as well as high level. So it's always difficult. There can be central toxicity versus peripheral as well as early, which can happen is when you start the medication or can be delayed toxicity. There are certain risk factors that we always worry about. One is the use of methylprednisolone in addition, uh, high blood pressure, fluid overload, uh, hypercholesterolemia, some drug interaction, hypomagnesemia. If you have pre-existing uh, brain disease, or especially if you have severe hepatic encephalopathy, 
as well as if you have a prolonged uh, cold ischemia time, or these are all the factors in hyponatremia. So sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate whether what are the factors, but when you stop the medication, these medica uh, this can improve. We have a uh, switch if you are on patient on tacrolimus to cyclosporin, or sometimes you have to stop it. So it varies based on the patient. Right. Thank you very much. And um, just to another question regarding cyclo cyclosporin, how do you follow the levels? It's a trough level, which should be prior to the dose that has been given. So that's the most important thing, that whether you're cyclosporin or tacrolimus, it's a trough level that we check. Thank you. Just another general question that has been posted is that for liver transplantation, how much uh, scoring should be given for HCC uh, as an exception? Because if we give an additional score, eventually then on top of the list we'll have mostly patients who've got HCC and those patients who do not have HCC would be down the list. Certain patients who've got um, ascites or encephalopathy, they wouldn't come up on the list because the HCC would take up on the priority. Uh, this is for me, right? Uh, you can answer it or Dr. Rela or Dr. Khalid can also answer it. It's a yeah, general question. Yeah, if Dr. Rela is there, I, I can, like, you know, and I, I can answer, but do, I would, Dr. Rela is uh, there. I would love to hear his point of view also. Is Dr. Rela on? Uh, okay, do you want me to repeat the question? So in the U.S., I can start, and then uh, in the U.S., uh, there is a pathway. We were giving uh, exceptional point uh, starting, uh, you know, with 22 melt, and then it was going all the way to up to the melt of 40, but we realized that many of the patients with HCC were getting transplanted, and patients who were really sick uh, were not. Then we capped that point at 35, and still we felt that there are too many people were getting transplanted. Now the new system in the U.S. is that based on which region you are in, we calculate what is the median MEL score that people are getting transplanted and we are giving less than three points, which we call MEL minus three points. Mm -hmm. So it can be varies in California, in our area, patients are now getting 27 points after six months of getting listed. So that six months, we get the time of looking at the biology of the cancer because patients, if they have a progressive cancer, they would gonna pass on. So right now it's MEL minus three in uh, in the US uh, for hepatocellular cancer mouth exception points. Thank you. I think that's a good strategy as well to use. All right, uh, if there are um, any other comments from the panel, I would request Dr. Asif, uh, who is uh, the chair of the session and along with Dr. Shahid Kareem to uh, conclude from the hepat hepatology side. And then after their comments, I would request Dr. Faisal Saudar and Dr. Wahab Dogar to give comments from the surgery side. Dr. Asif. Uh, wonderful session from uh, liver transplant to personalized patient care. Are you hearing me? Yes, Asif, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, wonderful session in the 14th Annual Conference of Pakistan Society of Study of Liver Disease from a liver transplant to the personalized patient care. Uh, it's a, a wonderful talk like, uh, first of all, Dr. Bilal Hamid, who, who presented a personalized immunosuppression, followed by the uh, Dr. Arsalan Khan, who presented the common complication which occur in the post, post liver transplant setting. Then the, uh, we learned a lot from Dr. Khalid Muntaz, uh, always in his in this talk about the any de novo or recurrence of primary causes. And in the end, the state of the art lecture is, is a really a great lecture because Dr. Rayla is a, always great to speak. Uh, I'm also, uh, uh, so I'm thankful to all the speakers, uh, wonderful session. Thank you, Dr. Asif. And I, if I can have comments from Dr. Faisal Saudar as well, if there are things that he need to add on. We've got Dr. Salan with us as well. If there are any questions posed for him. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was a great session and I would like to thank all the speakers and the PSSLD for organizing such a wonderful session. And what is the question for me? 
uh sir as a chair we would think we were thinking if you would like to conclude or add anything to to our session because you you've done you've been the chair of the session so dr dr faisal i have a question oh, for I you think atif much to add. it was great to hear from all the great speakers and i will just pass on to the co-chairs to have any comments Dr. So, Amna has a question. Yeah, so rather I just want to utilize the next five minutes. We have five minutes, so why not uh, to like uh, have few more uh, information from our speakers in the chairs? So uh, we ha right now, Dr. Faisal, Dr. Dogar, and Dr. Al Salan is over here. So when not to transplant and when to transplant in a local scenario? Um, what are your take on that in real life world when patients are coming to your center? So what are like when you actually at this point as per your institutional experiences all you decide about no these are not the best patient to transplant considering our uh, situation and our patients. So anything about your practical experiences you want to share? Dr. Faisal maybe you can and then Dr. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm um, a little confused in the hepatocellular cancer patients uh, because we know that patients who fulfill Milan and UCSF criteria, they are probably the best group to have a liver transplantation done. Uh, but beyond UCSF and Milan criteria, we do a lot of patients who are interested in liver transplantation, and I have not been sure which one are the one to be offered liver transplantation because on one side patients are pushing for liver transplantation if even if the long-term outcome is inferior and on the other hand uh, you don't have much of the uh, options available especially if patients have a uh, liver failure along with the cancer which is beyond UCSF and Milan and this has been a day-to-day -day problem uh, what we review from our own data the patients with alpha fetoprotein of more than 400 uh, are probably the one who will reoccur. But to put these things in place and refusing patients beyond UCS and Milan uh, in the living donor size, I always find difficult and would like comments from Professor Raila and Dr. Bilkalabi and Dr. Halabamdal that what should be the best way forward. Uh, how to draw the lines in these patients. I, I would just uh, like to address uh, some aspect of, you really pointed out it's, uh, HCC is a difficult group to decide. It's uh, the easiest one to transplant for most cases, so transplant surgeons would like to do it because you get uh, easier to have a text piece for that matter, but the, uh, essentially for HCC, uh, I think the paradigm is treating uh, a cancer rather than just transplant. So, uh, like in any cancers, you would uh, go by the stage of the disease. This is the general criteria. You would do the same in um, for liver transplant as well. Uh, again, staging is much more, uh, it, uh, it's much more complex than the usual uh, uh, ACLS stages and other cancers. <coughs> uh, and then living donor transplant in introduces another dynamic which is really important to consider. You have a ready transplant, but uh, at at least some risk to the donor. Uh, so in the end, obviously, the decision has to be personalized in a very, uh, you know, you have to really look into all the dynamics and then figure out uh, the, the risk versus benefit every time. But uh, I know there is no uh, magic wand here. Uh, generally, I think that is the thing we would do in HCCs. We would take it to be a cancer and deal accordingly. Thank you, Dr. Aslan. A few quick questions that have just come up. Uh, we've got a question from Dr. Dr. Saleh, uh, from Dr. Khalid, for Dr. Khalid, which is uh, the use of uh, budesonide in autoimmune hepatitis-related liver transplant. Okay, so the question, can you hear me, Arthur? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Khalid. We can okay, hear so you and we can see you as well now. Okay, that's good. Uh, so the question is about use of budesonide after uh, transplantation in autoimmune hepatitis. So in the setting of autoimmune hepatitis, when we offer a liver transplantation, we maintain these patients on low dose of steroids. Uh, 
Okay, and uh, the low dose of steroids mean that uh, after about two to three months, we taper the prednisone down to about five or 2.5 milligram, and then continue it for a long time period. As you may have actually recall in my presentation, I have quoted one of the paper where we have looked into the role of low dose of steroid. So it was effective in reducing the chances of recurrence of the disease. So instead of using prednisone, you can use budesonide, but as you are using low dose of prednisone, it has more or less the same safety profile as budesonide. So you can use either of these two in order to avoid the recurrence of uh, autoimmune hepatitis in the post-transplant setting. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Another question is, uh, would you target any specific titer for hepatitis B surface antibody before starting antiviral for patients with transplant for HBV who've received core positive donor? Uh, so I believe that the question is, what would be the hepatitis B surface antibody level? Yes. In patients who have received core antibody positive donor, right? The, the question is regarding stopping antiviral therapy for patients who've received uh, a, hepatitis, uh, a core positive donor, yes. So it means that the patient has hepatitis B surface antigen and they have received a core antibody positive and then they were treated. And then in the long run, what would be the level of hep B surface antibody at which you stop the antiviral therapy? Yes, sir. This is the question. So if they are able to actually mount hepatitis B surface antibody, which was a rare phenomenon, then you can consider stopping the antiviral therapy in these patients. But even after stopping the antiviral therapy, you have to keep these patients under monitor to make sure that their hepatitis B is not recurring. Right. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Thank you very much. If there are... Can I have a comment on this one? Yes, Dr. So, uh, Dr. Faisal, you can have a comment. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to share our experience about uh, transplanting hepatitis B core antibody levels uh, into the patient who didn't have a hepatitis B as an etiology for their liver failure. Uh, so what we used to do whenever there's an opportunity, we would try to vaccinate these patients uh, for hepatitis B before transplantation. But by and large, actually, you cannot take the whole course of building up the antibodies and you have to transplant. So we would continue with the antiviral treatment on these patients. And maybe six months on the line, we try to revaccinate them. And if they build a response, we will check by hepatitis B surface antibody. And then you can actually uh, stop the antiviral treatment on these patients. And we have been successful in few patients to do that. Right. Thank you, Dr. Faisal, for the comments. And uh, if there are no uh, other questions, we'll conclude this session. Indeed, it was a very informative one. And we'll move on to the next session, uh, which is going to continue. And I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sadat to moderate the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>